Can you hear me? Okay, have you eaten? Have you drunk? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much for coming to PQ Talks. If you are coming for PQ Talks, Flash Talks, uh, and if, if it's Saturday, the 10th of June, you are very welcome. Uh, I'm Pavel Drabek. I'll be moderating this, these Flash Talks. I'm the co-moderator of PQ Talks that is wonderfully curated by my dear friend, uh, Barbara Přihodová. Uh, we'll have six speakers, uh, and the way we'll go, they will present each no longer than 10 minutes, uh, and afterwards I will invite them back on the podium for questions and answers. If everyone is speak speaking to time, we'll have questions. We'll have time for the for the questions. Uh, so I'll be introducing them one after another, and when I introduce them, we'll do the swap over. Okay. So uh, first to present is. Uh, uh, Carmen Lee, who will be talking about sonography and resistance in Hong Kong water revolution in 2019. Carmen has to leave after her talk for another very important, very, very important meeting. So she can't be here for the Q&A. So if you would like to talk to her about their project, please find her at your favorite festival. That's PQ 2023. Okay. <laughs> Without further ado, uh, this is Carmen Lee talking about sonography and resistance in Hong Kong water revolution in 2019. Carmen, they are yours. Um, hi everyone, today I will talk about the sonography and resistance of the Hong Kong water revolution in 2019. And I still remember last PQ in 2019, I helped the Canada song to set up, and then I flew back to Hong Kong, and it was uh, 9th of June. So um, that day was the one million people who go on protest. And after four years and one day, I think uh, it is quite meaningful for me to share this with you. And I'm commonly, I'm a Hong Konger and also involved in the Hong Kong protest in 2019. I'm a theater maker, lighting designer, um, production manager, and I'm also the founder of Theater de Poulet, which we do devising and alternative theater. And I also present my show is called Be Water, my friend, on the last Thursday and Friday. And also I complete my first year of um, uh, master in device and object theater. And the other fun fact of me is I live in five different countries, Hong Kong, Ireland, Canada, uh, Czech Republic, and the Netherlands now. And a bit uh, about Hong Kong. Hong Kong is uh, located in the South China Sea. And on the bottom yellow part is Hong Kong. And we have a really close border with China. And we have our own currency and our own passport. And uh, for all the road signs in Hong Kong is in English and also in Cantonese. And with the British and also the Chinese uh, joint declaration agreement, we was promised to have our own freedom and democracy until 2047. And what is Hong Kong water revolution? I have to keep the long story short. It means like what I mentioned before will be disappear and some have been disappeared already. And today, I want to talk about how Hong Kong people using object to create a scenography. The first object I would like to talk about is brick. That's what we find on the pavement. And the second one is a laser pointer. And the third one is post-it note. So the first one is brick. And actually, this uh, scenography created by the Hong Kong people win the 2020 People's Choice winner from the Design Museum of London Beastly Design of the Year, and the artwork we name is Brick Arches. And the design is uh, combined by three bricks. Uh, it is a very simple um, but powerful structure um, because when the police car went uh, into the brick, the top one will fall, following by the two others. So make a really um, like a barricade for the police vehicle to really slow down their movement. And this is a really uh, simple to make, but it's very difficult to clear off uh, compared to the original robot. Oh. 
Yeah, and you can see we used it in different location of Hong Kong. And sometimes um, for Hong Kong people, they will use the brick also to build a wall on the street. And also they will uh, create like a traditional grave that symbolize to ask the people in power to go to hell. <laughs> and also uh, they also combine brick with another material, which is bamboo, uh, which is a really famous material uh, Hong Kong used for scaffolding, if you know about it. And it's, I think it's also increased the difficulty for the police vehicle to like break through. And that's how uh, Hong Kong people using that to create different structure on the street. And the second object I want to talk about is laser pointer that uh, we use to confuse the police camera and CCTV because they used to record our face. And how the scenography was created because one of the student leader was carrying 10 laser pointer and he was arrested by the police because uh, police think it is a really dangerous weapon. Uh, he carried. So that's why there's one day Hong Kong people uh, go to like a space museum. In the middle of the guy, he's holding like a Po China newspaper. And I think there's hundreds and thousands of laser pointer pointing to the newspaper. It's like a collective, like experimental experience that uh, the people want to show the government that laser pointer is not as dangerous as you said, and it will not burn a paper. So this is an experience that we create, and we also create some light uh, show with the laser pointer, and we do graffiti with light on the space museum. Yeah. And this is the original shape of the space museum. It's like a white uh, cube. And the third object I want to talk about is the post-it note. Actually, it's inspired by the Czech people um, because we create a lantern wall, which also located in Prague. So you are very welcome to visit the lantern wall in Prague. Uh, it's also uh, the anti-communist activists in 1980. They used the lantern wall to protest against the Communist Party. So I think Hong Kong people uh, get a lot of inspiration from the Czech people. Thank you so much for that. And uh, we, for Hong Kong people, you, we use post-it note to create a lantern wall, which uh, let Hong Kong people or people from other country to share what is their opinion or exchange idea through the wall. And sometimes the wall will also happen in like tunnel or uh, foot bridges, and sometimes people make it a really big uh, poster. And sometimes people use post-it note to create images. And this is an example how Hong Kong people transfer like a tunnel into like a collective installation, and you can see people also use a uh, transparent plastic to protect the work that Hong Kong people made. And the work is also over the top or on the floor as well. And sometimes people will post a question on the wall and maybe on that day you will get 1,000 or 2,000 different answers. I think it is a very inspiring and like an open platform to let people to exchange ideas. And after that, people transfer the um, lantern wall into flat to carry on the street. And also they make uh, the post-it note on the body as well. And although now the protest is really suppressed by the Hong Kong government and what we create on the street uh, has been disappeared, but I think disappearance can be also scenography, which is very inspired by a Hong Kong artist called Giraffe Learn, which is called Paper Over the Crack. 
And the government used a really quick fix to use concrete to like lay all the pavement and also use a really different colors of paint to cover over our slogan. And I think this artist is very clever that only used a yellow gaffer tape to just circle around what the government like uh, cover up. And he also will create like a description and the work is paper over the crack. The year is 2019 and 2020 and the material very obviously is a different color of paint and the over is Hong Kong government and the size is the size that uh, he circled. And the artist is uh, one question about Hong Kong people because now no one uh, is there or uh, talking about that. So he want to ask Hong Kong people whether it is normal now what is happening in Hong Kong and the Hong Kong government want to like cover the surface of the problem but actually they didn't really solve the inner issue and the artist is really interested in street arts because like he think uh, it can narrow down the distance between the art and the audience. And this is another example because the government used cleaner to clean off our, our things, so the materials is cleaner. And this is the end of my presentation. And if you are interested more about how uh, Hong Kong people create scenography, you are really welcome to take a picture of my contact information. And thank you so much. And Gloria to Hong Kong. Yun Wen Gong Guai Hong Kong. Uh, Carmen Lee, thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, f uh, fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, I would like now, now I would like to uh, invite the, to the stage uh, Charlotte Estegar, Ono, and Lydia Han. So Lydia Han will talk first uh, on behalf of Sally Dean, who's unwell. So very kindly, two colleagues have offered to present the work for them. So. Uh, Lydia Han will start presenting, and for the Q&A, Charlotte Oestegar will, will join. Lydia, it's over to you, and the presentation is Saladin's The Somatic Costume Dressing Room, Attending to Touch and the Poetic. Is that correct? That's correct. Over to you. Which bit am I pressing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The Somatic Costume Dressing Room, Attending to Touch and the Poetic. Attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. The somatic costume dressing room is part of Sally Dean's PhD in artistic research at Oslo National Academy of the Arts with supervisors Christina Lindgren and Joan Davis. The somatic costume dressing room is an artistic research project and portal, an online and live meeting place, often in home environments, with Sally guiding wearers through the transformative potential of wearing, dressing, making with simple materials. The haptic focus, these haptic focused processes of embodying materiality become embodied conversations through the somatic method of proces processual attention, attending to the nonverbal, verbal, and the unstable assemblages of bodies. From 2020 to 2023, Sally has given approximately 85 one-to-one -one guided dressing sessions. The somatic costume dressing room applies embodied costume design and somatic pra practices to, concepts, to the concept, practice, and liminal site of a dressing room. These include um, the embodied costume design theory and somatic practices, as you can read here. Um, in the somatic costume dressing room, costumes are co-designed in the moment from the wearer, wearer's arising psychophysical needs, such as rest, grief, or reconne reconnection to the heart. Instead of costumes being a visual effect to serve a theme or character within a performance, or a garment to sell, could it be a haptic-focused process, advocating embodiment, consciousness, and well-being? Attending begins with choreographing attention to the internal, tacit, tactile experiences of the wearer, a somatic approach. Wearers are guided into a wear-wearing, 
bringing attention to the effects of costumes, touch on the body, wearing, a meeting between bodies and materials, becoming a bridge to knowing and knowledge through sensorial and embodied experience. The somatic approach decentralizes the value of costume away from more external and aesthetic preferences as finished form. Somatic costumes become somatic material elements, unfinished, in a state of flux, and a response to body assemblages, the material and the human. The costume is no longer one spe specified form that exists before it is worn by the performer and opens it pot its potential to being a collection of materials, pre-forms, with its existence coming to life through invited rituals of interaction a costume being the live meeting between the wearer and the materials. What is a dressing room? Dressing rooms are liminal places of entanglement and transition, the pre and the post performance spaces. As both public and private spheres, they are continually imp improvised and rehearsed. They harbour both the mundane as well as the interior and exterior transformative processes of dressing up. Dressing rooms often reveal unfinished states where bodies are between dressing and undressing with costumes and environments in a state of flux. Human bodies inside are not yet performers, but not yet audience. Costume bodies are between being worn and taken off, between daily life clothing and clothing in a performance. All bodies become entangled with unknown potential. Pluraliverse, connecting through a sense of assemblage and entanglement. The way of working no longer stays with a static assumption of both what the costume might do to bodies or what bodies might do to costumes, but also enabled to respond to the ongoing appearance of multiple bodies, human, costume, and other, in the room. From the dressing room and touch program, the intention of design shifts. No longer is design for a single costume or performance, but instead becoming about choreographing attention, an experiential place that is always changing in a state of flux. It becomes about attending through touch, returning us to the material and sensorial connection. If you play the video, please. Also becoming such kind of creatures and and I felt I felt I was really reminded that when I was a child we, yeah. how we had this strange house down the street with lots of with the woman lived there with lots of uh, suitcases full mm. of stuff so there was you know apart from the the touch there was also shape uh, shape became really important I could feel myself like with the with this, it was it was a kind of kinesthetic sense of or or a feeling of wanting to hold the head in place, and at the same time, I felt like a warrior because I had a red headband. Mm -hmm. So it was also like character building. Yeah, no, it's it's just so interesting to not know what you look like, but and that's why I felt that it was important to have my eyes closed because with the materials, I imagined from the inside. Hmm. What I looked like, what was the character, what was the extensions, like what was the shape of me. But I didn't know. But then I could act as if, you know, feeling like that, imagining looking like that. Exactly. Yeah. No, it feels like hmm. um, this is, I keep talking about how the materials themselves activate the imagination. Yes. As opposed yes. to of starting with the imagination or a concept. Yes. And then trying to make the costume or make the choreography. Yeah. It's like, okay, we start with what the body and the materials need, and then the imagination gets activated yeah. on its own. Yeah. And I find this, I just find this so yeah. nice. It's a it different, is. different pathway. Yes, it is. And I think then we're really listening. I'm not trying to manipulate a material into my concept. 
Mm. Because I'm already, no. we create the concept together. Yeah. This is really important. And something about it that also becomes less self-conscious. Because it's like, I can be and I can feel like this sort of wow, huge warrior. Mm. And at the same time, I don't know if the paper on my head is doing this. And I'm covered in, in a pink little, you know, I don't know. Mm. And then, but if I saw the image first, and then try to act like the image looked, right. I will act with it like a reflection of myself. But this was the feeling that was allowed to grow into the materials as well. It's like I wanted to feel the weight and then see what I could. You wanted to play with the materials. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then there was suddenly one thing you wanted to find the elastic, and I was like, mm, I don't like the smell of that which I wouldn't have thought I would say. I thought more like, oh no, the feeling isn't right, or the touch, but it was like, no. So all the senses are part of it. And I was also playing with, even with closed eyes, there was some really light and some really darkness. So you could even play with the visual sense with the materials, mm -hmm. even with closed eyes. Oh, uh, that's, of mm. course, that's mm. right, yes. I was really surprised at the undressing and how light it felt, because by the end I was so used to the weight of the things mm -hmm. that it just felt like my natural weight. And then when it came up, I was like, oh, holy smokes, I'm like, light. it's like feathers. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And sometimes so the sometimes impact is actually yeah. stronger after than yeah. during. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, you could feel the absence of something or the, or the, uh, just the air or just the, yeah, the lack of something mm -hmm. that had been there. And that, yeah, like lifted the weight. So, and point. I really felt like the times when you were also just touching me with your hands and things, I really felt that there was, that everything was, uh, was welcome. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I didn't feel like you were suddenly directing me or, mm -hmm. or controlling something. I felt like, Oh yes, I wanted that. Oh yes, okay. yeah. Oh, thank you. That's nice to that hear. Was really actually. Good. Nice. So that's uh, so it was just a lot of fun. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I also think it's fun too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's also fun too. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lydia, for presenting of, of Sally Dean. Uh, our third speaker is Heli Saloma, who will be talking about costume as an emotional state in a transmedia digital narrative. Is that correct? Wonderful. Heli, this is over to you. Thank you. That is, okay, sorry about that. Hey, I'm uh, Heli Saloma, I'm a digital costume designer and a lecturer uh, of uh, fashion design technology at the Herangawaka Victoria University of Wellington. Um, during this next 10 minutes, I'm going to provide a quick overview on one of my research projects, that's called uh, Shadow Work. This project allows me to explore the costume as an emotional state in a transmedia digital narrative. The production started as a video game in 2020, um, but the story is currently developed into a CGI animated feature film parallel to the game production. Most of the concepts visualizing the current stage of the production and this presentation are generated with artificial intelligence. In the first years of my career, I designed uh, mostly stage costumes for performance, musicals, dance, circus, um, but um, I transformed my my skills into digital making, into animations, virtual reality and video games. But for the most, um, most of the last six years I've been uh, wor uh, working on games um, such as these two, Control and Pax Day. Control was the first game I designed costumes for and it was released in 2019. It has sold over three million units uh, by this day and has won several video game awards related to games, art and design. And Pax Day is still in development with an undefined release date but I've been working on their costumes since 2020. 
Pax Day is a social multiplayer game inspired by the legends of the medieval era and aimed for the global market. Alongside my lecturer role and the costume working Pax Day, um, I've been working on shadow work. It explores the Jungian idea of the shadow and the unconscious self. And the digital costumes in this project communicates the progression of the character's inner struggle and emotional state. I'm working on the project with two friends and colleagues um, from Victoria University, Areta Echevarria and Raki Syed. They both have previously worked at Veda, Veda Digital on feature films such as The Hobbit Trilogy and Avatar. Raki and Areta are currently presenting the work in progress version of the animated adaption of Shadow Work at the Annecy Film Festival as part of the, um, their three months residency and I'm about to join them right after PQ. Um, in the game version of Shadow Work, um, we, delivered, uh, we delivered, uh, developed the context and narrative together, um, but Areto is mostly resp responsible for the direction and technical work, and Rocky writes the script, and I'm designing the characters. So Shadow Work is a story of a young woman called Swanhild, who has never come to terms with her mother abandoning her as a child. She lives at home with her cold and distant, distant father in the east, eastern suburbs of Wellington. One day, there's a knock at the door, and Swanhild is greeted with a doppelganger, a perfect copy of herself. To her shock, her father welcomes the doppelganger with love and affection, and proceeds to close the door on Swanhild, shutting her out of his life. Banished for, from her father's house, Swanhild ends up in a moldy one-bedroom flat on the other side of the town. And Swanhild wakes up each night and tries to find a way back home. But the once familiar suburbs are somehow transformed, distorted, uncanny, and empty. As Swanhild tries a different route to her father's house each night, she's confronted by the doppelganger and her um, monstrous minions that are determined to keep her away from her father. Along the game, it dawns to Swanhild that the doppelganger is in fact her own shadow, an aggressive and repressed part of her psyche and the monsters are manifestations of her unresolved trauma. As one hilt battles the shadow creatures, something stirs inside her. Through her emotional turmoil, psychic abilities are awakened, and she discovers she is able to affect the world around her in ways that seem to be powered by her emotional state. Since shadow work explores the depths of the unconscious and our struggles with our internal shadows, I've looked at uh, Freud's theory of the mind to define the enemy concept for the game. According to the theory, the conscious mind represents only a small and accessible aspect of the human psyche. The creatures that Swanhild confronts are manifestations of her traumas and suppressed emotions. While she proceeds through the dark streets of Wellington towards her father's house, she encounters enemy types that spawn from, uh, that spawn from different levels of her unconscious mind. From the deepest levels of the unconscious spawn the shadow creatures that have very little resemblance to a human form, but towards the surface of the awareness, Swanhild's internal monsters evolve towards something recognizable as a human. As Swanhild uh, battles the creatures, her emotional turmoil awakens psychic abilities that are powered by her emotional state. Uh, since the emotional state has a significance to the narrative, game mechanics, and the battle system, it needs to be clearly communicated to the player through Swan Hill's appearance. I've used the bodily maps of emotions by Numa Ma et al. Um, as a starting point for visualizing emotions through costume. The bodily maps are based on a research defining body locations of uh, basic emotions. Hot colors um, show regions that are stimulated during the emotion, and cool colors indicate deactivated areas. The costume needs to imitate the areas of activation and deactivation in the body to enhance the embodiment of an emotion when player projects themselves to the game character. In the game, Swan Hill's emotional state is tracked within a matrix that is based on James Russell's balance arousal emotional model. Swanhill's emotions are triggered by items connected to, a specific, uh, to specific memories that inflict that emotion. So the player can select an item to shift Swanhill's emotional state along the positive or negative or activated and deactivated axis. 
As part of the game mechanics, the player tries to resolve the manif manifestations of Swan Hill's fears and traumas through a selection of emotional response. Um, sorry, I might have been a slide early. Um, here we go. Um, to, visualize, uh, to, to visualize the shift of the emotional state in costume, I used AI to generate references for visual effects, patterns and colors that we could add on the costume to express the emotion. Uh, since changing the actual form of the costume is um, in the game space is actually technically really challenging. So, uh, con concluding this exploration, I visualized the extremes of each axis to define the relative change in the effect and color on the costume across the matrix. On the deactivated stage, the pattern is concentrated around the limbs of the character, and towards the activation, the pattern first covers the body and gathers around the chest area until at the, end, at the height of the activation, breaks out from the boundaries of the body. In addition to the change of location within the body surface, the pattern is passive on the deactivated stage and animated on the activated stage, swirling and beaming around the character's body. On the negative end of the horizontal axis, the pattern is tangled, but towards the positive end, it untangles and turns into radiance. Towards the center, sorry, Towards the center of the matrix, the special effects diminishes into the neutral stage. The effect functions similarly on the diagonal axis, meeting the visual opposites on both ends of the scale. In addition to expressing the, and the emotional shifts through appearance, the character will perform according to the emotional state. And this is achieved in collaboration with human actors through the performance, cap performance capture technology. Um, so the emotional state is visualized on the base layer of Swan Hill's costume. Growing up, Swan Hill was always trying to meet her father's expectations and took up boxing since it was what her father wanted. Hitting things hard and showing no weakness seemed to please her father, but, com but compliance became a way to access love. Swan Hill began treating everything as a sport in which she must overachieve to feel worthy. Towards the end of the story, Swan Hill turns out to be just another shadow, an imitation of the doppelganger that is the real Swan Hill. Therefore, she represents the final form in the evolution of the enemy types and the surfacing of the, sh of the hidden shelf, hidden self. Um, lastly, the materials in shadow work have been inspired by the metaphorical image of emotional package. Um, and the plastic qualities of the package materialized through a series of AI-generated images have informed some of the digital material exploration of Swan Hill's overlayer. And this is basically where the production stands um, currently, and this content is waiting for technical testing to see how the proposed communication of emotions and materialization functions in the game space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heli. Uh, wonderful. Uh, our next uh, presentation is by two speakers, Susanna Sul and Ingevil Fosheim. And they will be talking about costume as a responsive practice. Is that correct? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah, the audience is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, all. Um, Really nice to see you all here, and we would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present here today. We are Susanna Sogra and Inge Fossheim, and we are both doctoral candidates in costume design at Aalto University, Finland. And we are here to today to talk about costume as a responsive practice. No, thanks. <laughs> Our talk is a first sharing of this topic that we are developing into a research article in the future. In this presentation, we will unpack some key notions that we find central to responsive costume practice. We wish to invite discussion on ideas and insights that come from our practices as artist researchers in costume design for devised, process-led live performance. 
What connects us uh, is our interest in artistic practice that is motivated by exploration and discovery and that embraces risks and failures. For us, this creates a certain level of freedom that allows new ways of working and new ways of thinking with and through costume. It enables us to develop artistic practices that evolve in response to ethical shifts that are currently changing the values in our field. So we see a value shift taking place in costume design and in performing arts more broadly that is shaped by ethical shifts around notions of shared agency and env environmental awareness. By definition, agency is the ability to influence and to cause effects. Current philosophical discussions around agency have led us to define all agencies as shared, thus changing how we, through costume design practice, relate with and make sense of each other and the world. For us, working with uh, agency as a shared quality, where all and anything has the ability to influence and to cause effects, directs our learning by doing practices towards the potential of more than human materials to influence our thinking and actions. Taking the limited carrying capacity of our planet into consideration in all aspects of costume design is now a necessity. This means that the costume design practices we consider acceptable in performance making need rethinking. In order to move away from established yet outdated and unsustainable modes of production towards more environmentally responsible alternatives, our values have to change. For us, this value shift has led our costume design and research practices to become more responsive. So what do we then mean by responsive costume design practice? In many ways, it can of course be claimed that costume is always responsive as it responds with the other elements in performance. However, when we talk about responsive costume design, we focus on costume design processes that go beyond any individual performance, an approach that is based on actively sensitizing ourselves and turning our attention towards the materials, our values, and the costume design process as a whole. And to define what we actually mean with responsive costume practice, in the following we will present four key qualities that we find essential to responsive costume design. These are open-ended, materially informed, connective, responsible. Open-endedness starts with a focus shift from result to process. This means not result-driven, but explorative working methods, where the focus is on the process itself and on what is at hand in the present, instead of focusing on a ready product. This creates awareness of the designer's subjective lived experience, their values and biases. This more holistic approach makes visible the problematic aspects of one's own practice and the things we enjoy and appreciate. Thus, it also enables a more sustainable relationship with the work and the possibility for new insights. We consider this as the foundation of any transformative practice and thinking. A materially informed approach means learning with and alongside the materials we work with. In practice, this requires us to actively listen to the materials and allow them to guide our thinking and processes of making. Such awareness of materials connects the different ways of knowing that we work with. It bridges lived experience, intuitive and bodily knowledge with what is valuable to us and what we wish to express through our work. Connective means approaching the work through processes of connection. Such open-ended, explorative and materially informed approach creates a connection between the costume designer's work, their values and sense of meaning. For us, extending these processes to include our human and other than human collaborators makes it possible to create deeper connections between the performance making as a whole and the world around us. Costume design is then no longer about the individual experience, but about the approach itself, with all human and other than human collaborators actively contributing within a shared context. 
Responsible means taking these connections of shared agency into account. Being responsible is about wanting the better, about having compassion and acknowledging that all life is vulnerable. Responsible means saying no and accepting that everything is not possible, that there are limits to our consumption of material and human resources. Responsibility is about being accountable and taking action by exploring and implementing change to unsustainable aspects of our work. Asking ourselves, what are the problematic areas of own design practice at all stages of the costume creation process? And collectively and individually asking, how might we create a more sustainable performance making culture? And why does this matter? At the end of the day, as co professional costume designers, performance makers, researchers and educators, we are storytellers. And we need to stop telling ourselves and each other that the show must go on and anything is possible, regardless of consequences. For us, responsive costume practice enables us to examine our belief systems, biases and values to change our mindsets towards an awareness-based systems change. This enables us to tell stories that are responsive to the complex and diverse environments we practice within and reflect and contribute towards the systems change already going on. Thank you all. This was our flash talk. We would like to thank our collaborators and funding bodies and you for being present here today. And the ideas, just a moment, <laughs> the ideas that we uh, have presented here today draw from um, two articles that we have co-authored with Professor Sofia Pantobaki. Both these articles are available for free online. And if you wish to, where's our slide? It's not showing. Can we get it back? Yeah, thank you. So if you wish to have a read, please do. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Susanna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ingvil. Uh, uh, our next, the next talk is uh, to be presented by Courtney Gaston and Robin Mazzola. I would like to invite you both to the stage now, uh, who will be presenting on Lit from Within, merging the disciplines of lighting and costume. Courtney Gaston and Robin Mazzola. Over to you. Hi, my name is Courtney Gaston. I am the lighting and media professor at Wesleyan University in Connecticut in the US. And I'm Robin Mazzola. Um, I'm the costume shop manager. I'm a costume construction specialist. And I've worked with Courtney for several years and on this research. So my first experience with costume lighting was actually part of a project that I presented here at PQ in 2019 in the Studio Stage series. And that project sparked an interest to find better ways to integrate light into costuming. I was interested in how to go beyond costuming as clothing on the exterior of the body only, to have a greater integrated application. Lighting in costumes was interesting, but typically I had only seen it used as flash without significant storytelling. We wanted to bring the two elements together as a narrative, that the spectacle-like elements could add to the story rather than distract from it. So the initial impetus for this research came from a commissioned piece. I was asked to create a wearable flash and dazzle element for a campy production. So after creating a seven-foot articulated lanternfish, I asked Courtney if she would add some lights. So the costumes came to me after they had already been built. And as I began working on them, I realized that integrating the lighting into an already built costume was going to be more challenging because of access. Uh, the co I was constantly needing to work inside and outside of the costume simultaneously. So I was, and I was frustrated because as I worked, new ideas kept popping into my head, but the structure just wasn't there to support it. So it became more of a where can I put the lights to make it look cool instead of a dramaturgically considered design. So we realized that we needed to be designing together in tandem, which is directly in contrast to how lighting and costumes normally would work. These costumes opened our eyes to the possibilities and we wanted to explore the potential to use costume and lights as a narrative de device together. So in the spring of 2022, we applied for grant funding so that we could continue our work. 
because there was a lot of rapidly evolving technology that we just didn't have access to the first time. Uh, things like more complex microcontrollers, sensors, and different styles of LED lighting, both analog and digital. And as Courtney was exploring these new technologies, I was branching out from my standard costume pieces, and I was testing substrates and materials that would better support the tech without impacting our visual design. I worked with a range of warblers, Wonderflex, Foss shape, uh, spring steel, tubing, wire types, and I assure you chicken wire made an appearance in one of the prototypes. <laughs> uh, if you play the slide. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, in order to explore the dramaturgy and context of the costume lighting, we started with the script. We chose A Midsummer Night's Dream, focusing on illustrating the relationships between the real and the magical. So we sat down at Robin's dining room table and started talking and sketching and making a wish list of all the possible directions that we could go. So we chose Titania and one of her fairy cohorts as our subjects. As we started thumbnailing ideas, we were discussing incorporating space and structure for Courtney's elements, and then we started altering the shape and the silhouette of the piece to accommodate in both of those characters. I realized quickly I needed to build a base of structures within that were strong enough to house the lights well, both safely and securely. So when we began construction, one of our concerns was making sure that the costumes could compete with stage lighting on a limited power source. So to amplify lighting as much as possible, I used highly reflective safety materials on a rigid structure of warbla and piping. Costume pieces were built independent of one another. So the structure, the point being for ease of access and installation for Courtney's lighting while I was continuing on the fabric portion. These choices created a strong base for the lights without inhibiting the performer and the piece that could be disassembled for cleaning and maintenance in the future. So because Robin created the substructure independent of the decorative overlays, I was able to work earlier in the process. So during these steps, I made several discoveries. So for instance, uh, we, were able to, we were able to share the pieces for revisions. Uh, for instance, the mushroom head, I realized that I not only wanted to have the light up spots on the top of the cap of the mushroom, but I wanted to illuminate the gills under the mushroom from within. So I had to send it back to the costume shop so it needed more reflective materials and additional mounting structures for the side emitting LED tape. So Robin was able to add the structure and the removable, re removable, important, reflective panels, and then return it to me so that I could continue work. So for Titania, I chose to utilize the traditional underlayer of cage panniers. I removed all of the extra fabric and I reinforced the supports and added removable reflective insert overlays. The fact that these panels were removable allowed Courtney to access her lighting, to make changes, and to revise it, attaching to the boning, and ultimately hide all of the wiring while amplifying the light effect. So at this point, I'd like to pause and thank the humble zip tie. Uh, <laughs> these allowed us to prototype rapidly, but also I could take it apart quickly when it needed to be redone. <laughs> Uh, for the Titania's necklace, uh, we came to the similar approach. We wanted the magical impact of the flowers being able to bloom. So I first built the base, and then while Courtney was wiring, I was down in my shop sculpting different shapes of fluted flowers, uh, painting them with a tri um, excuse me, an iridescent amplifying effect to improve the small lights. And then we brought them together to create a dramatic reveal moment on stage. So how do we control this? The trick was combining analog and digitally, digitally addressable lighting. For instance, Titania's necklace and the mushroom cap were able to run complex pattern effects, but to achieve the highest tenable brightness for a wearable item, the larger costume elements we used analog RGB tape. This also reduced the cost, but it meant that we had two different power requirements within the same costume and a 12 volt lithium ion battery pack to hide. So, we were using a feather microcontroller from Adafruit. I was able to route the data and the power to each element individually, which gave me discrete control over the costume. And since these were wearable items, the footprint of the power and control were critical. The goal being to get the, the control elements to the smallest possible size. 
uh, splitting the control and the battery allowed us a little bit more flexibility. So we were able to put them in different locations on the body. Everything was wired together with JST connectors, which allowed us to repeatedly separate the pieces without damaging the wiring. This also allowed quick and easy dressing and a costume that was simple to disassemble for cleaning and maintenance. All of this collaboration and rapid prototyping brought us to a working product. You played the mushroom video. So our fairy was designed to use light as camouflage so that she could be a fairy moving about this space and interacting, or she could be a magical mushroom hiding within the forest. It was constructed using semi-sheer iridescent fabrics that would react well with stage lighting, and when needed in the play, the fairy could then camouflage herself by lifting the gill skirt up, closing the space, and all of her illumination would come to life. Um, so you can see... This is when she's in her magical fairy state. We had a very, very enthusiastic performer who volunteered for us. <laughs> so this is the underside of the mushroom cap. So you can see the highly reflective material that was under there. It helped amplify the lighting so that we could use a lower voltage while still getting a dramatic effect. So. To Tanya. So for Tatanya, um, our regal and magical fairy queen. So the idea behind the, and you could, sorry, you could play the Tatanya video now. So the idea behind the lighting for Tatanya's costume is that she is inherently magical and therefore her power isn't always on display. So instead, it's a visual representation of the power that she holds within her. So with all of that in mind, we use light to highlight when she exerts her power. So all of the elements would be hidden within the costume. You wouldn't be able to see the actual light sources when they were not illuminated. Uh, this way that they could be triggered to blast light out at chosen moments within the text, for instance, when she confronts Oberon. So in the moments, her wig, her necklace, and her very being emits, emits light from her... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Jet lag. Um, in, the, in the moments when she emits her power, her hair, necklace, and armor, as well as the underside of her skirts, glow. The underskirt has a glass bead reflective material, which was one of our explorations and research. One of our discoveries is that this fabric has an extremely narrow field for reflectivity, so you can see it in the video, but from the, a slightest degree to the side, it goes flat. So we will not be using that in our next prototype. To explain, it means that it can only be seen from the perspective of the light source itself. So if you were off center of where the light was coming from, it didn't look like anything. Here's a close up of the necklace. And so the flowers still looked like flowers without the light being, being illuminated. And for the wig, the lights were hidden as well. They were not obvious until she chooses to emit her power for the dramaturgy. So. That is our lighting in costume. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Courtney. Thank you very much, Robin, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, the final flash talk of our panel today is, is uh, by Zuzu Hudek, uh, who will be talking about costume as a main character. Zuzu, over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Uzo Hudek. I'm a stage and costume designer, visual artist and art teacher living in Bratislava in Slovakia. Costumes, uh, dance, body and movement became my passion. The main goal of my latest project is to create costume, uh, costumes and visual objects uh, that uh, perform as the main characters of the show. I'm not only decorating the choreographer's work, but the choreographer is decorating my work. Let's watch the first video.
your friends this time. The main goal of the project Metamorphosis was to create costumes which change their appearance and form during the time on the stage, together with the body movement of the performer, light or sound. The costumes and objects were created as first. I connected various shapes and materials which could be inspirative for the performers. The costumes and materials started to create the choreography and the performers created the costumes out of inanimate objects. It was a beautiful collaboration. After this uh, experimental project, After this experimental project, Metamorphosis, we started to think about the complete performance. What it should be about. There is a big gap in contemporary dance. There uh, do not really exist the performances for younger generation. And how we, could like, uh, we would like to bring the contemporary dance to a wider audience if we do not educate the next generation. So we decided to create one colorful, very dynamic and visual performance for the youngsters inspired by constantly changing images of social networks. The goal stay, stayed the same, metamorpho metamorphosis. I did the research, asked the youngsters a lot of questions about uh, the music, fashion, feelings, friendships and interests relationships, and everything about their life. We got plenty of materials to work with. We started to search for the concrete scenes. The materials and visual objects were always the starting point for creating the choreography and the concepts. Uh, what was amazing for me, because finally my vision was the first and not the last. Let's see the short trailer. Thank you very much. The process of the transformation in adolescence offers a huge number of subtopics, reactions to changes in the body, self-evaluation, the search for identity, unclear futures, social events, and the uncontrolled influence of social networks. The costumes do not follow any particular style. 
I used only fragments. The main goal was to create garments which transform, metamorphose during the performance. Each part of the costume had various functions and interpretations. The big hoodie was black, but silver from the other side. Could be a hat, jewelry, puppet, mask, symbol of loneliness and depression, and when it was silver, it could produce light. The costumes were constructed as a puzzle and the character could be changed completely. I thought about six costumes when I was creating one. I had to, uh, it had to be functional, easy to manipulate, expressive in the same time. We didn't have uh, enough money and time to rehearse and experiment. The time pressure was a strong limitation, which I didn't like at all. <laughs> the inflatable uh, cocoons were, made, uh, were, were the main part of the whole process. We rehearsed as most with them. However, we didn't use the full potential of this material. There were always some technical problems to solve and not so much time for the creative work. So I hope that I will get a chance to work with that a little bit more in the future. The brainstorm and uh, production of the costume was very hard. I set up uh, many limitations for myself. I decided that I will re uh, recycle everything what I found at home and what my friends gave me as uh, old uh, garments. So I created the costumes out of that. I didn't really want to buy anything new. Costumes uh, should go through a complete transformation, deconstructed and constructed again in a different order. All the things should be packed into a small backpack and the metamorphose of the costume was the, was the story. We rehearsed only three complete weeks. We worked with a very low budget. Most of the contemporary da uh, dance creators work in the same conditions. There is no steady place. Uh, we have only one big old gym where you have limited time because many others are rehearsing there. The vision is always great, the effort as well, but we cannot compare our work with the worldwide productions. I always feel that we stay just on the first step and we do, do not have capacity to go further. Simultaneously with this, my project, I provided around 10 interviews with contemporary dance professional, professionals living and working in Slovakia. I ask them how do they work with costume and scenography and what are the issues in the creative process. Uh, here are the outcomes. So as you can see, uh, this, uh, these are the answers what they, uh, what they gave me, uh, what they will need uh, to make uh, the collaboration between dancers and uh, creators uh, better. So you can see that there is the, the first thing, appropriate budget, because many times they, they, have, they got very uh, low money and they cannot spread it into such a big team, uh, the money. So they are happy that they can pay the dancers, so they just uh, give them some clothes and they go on the stage. Uh, they want to have the whole creative uh, team around from the beginning, a permanent space to rehearse and experiment, enough time to run the creative process. Uh, and they would like to have the interdisciplinary learning process. And what they really like is to have some special training costumes for dancers. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Zuzu. I would now like to invite all the speakers on the stage. Okay, thank you very much. There should be a, ha a hand mi a microphone for every of the, each of the set. He's wonderful. And we have Izzy and Jacob with handheld microphones. Please grab them over here. And uh, uh, we have time for some questions. Are there any questions in the room? Yes, there is a question up there. This the gentleman with a beard. Okay. Okay. There's a. Okay, do you know what? Can I, can I hold? Keep one of the mics if it's good for you. Okay. 
Hi. Hi. Oh. Hi. Okay, maybe perhaps the microphone. Is it on? Yes. Okay. Could you try that one? Hi. Okay. Uh, I have a question, especially for Haley. Uh, you touched a little bit upon the subject of AI as a source of inspiration, and uh, it's definitely something incredible, but also terrifying. So I'm wondering um, how can AI be bring our practices as costume designers further, and how uh, what's its limitations also? I think that's a, oh, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, that's a whole discussion that we're going between our colleagues my, in, at the University of Wellington. Use of AI um, within the creative practice and um, I do encourage my students to use it um, if they use it properly. Um, they can use it um, in a very lazy way and try to take a shortcut to their projects but you can see immediately if the prompt of the um, of the generated image is not iterated um, far enough, but um, what, what I believe is that um, it's just another tool such as um, Photoshop. Um, you need to learn how to use it, to use it effectively and um, to the, the usual amount of uh, ideation and iteration on the prompts um, to, to come to the results. But um, in the production, in shadow work, I have um, not really created any concept since uh, with the AI, um, it's allowing me to explore or come, uh, arrive these kind of happy surprises or happy accidents, um, that especially with the visual effects that um, I can further just do, um, bring to the technical testing. And the technical testing is the first barrier in, in the design process since um, usually after the technical testing, it comes back to the conceptual um, concept stage. So the artificial in intelligence allows me to just kind of quickly produce a new patch and then um, do that, that kind of like uh, iteration loop with the testing um, with that. Thank you very much, Heli. Thank you very much for the question. Do you have any more questions? And I would like to ask people to just briefly introduce themselves. Jacob, there is a hand up there. Hi, I have a question for... Could you please introduce yourself? Oh, my Sorry. name is Chelsea June. I'm a freelance costume designer based in New York. Um, I have a question for Courtney and Robin about your costumes and light. And I was wondering if you started to explore any kind of motion tracking integration with it so that when a performer takes a certain action or they enter a certain space on the stage, the costume reacts. So that's in, uh, that's in the, the later stages of our research grant. Um, unfortunately, we didn't make it to that point yet. But we do, that is part of the plan is to continue. We'd like to explore being able to manipulate the light in the costumes by actions and movements of the performer as well as their relativity to other objects or other actors on stage uh, because there is, there's a lot really to mine there to be used in a dramaturgical concept. Um, also, uh, a lot of emphasis is uh, a lot of emphasis on the repeatability of it. Um, one of the things we're running into and we've seen is uh, that you can get it to work once, but not again. Uh, so the intent behind this would be a long running performance that you could control. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much for the answers. Any more questions? Yes, Rachel, Jacob, Rachel Hahn over there. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, hi, so my name's Aiden. I'm from Australia, um, and I'm a, I've got more of a theatrical background, um, and I'm also a cosplayer on the side. Um, and so my question was also in regards to, um, like, Courtney and Robin with your whole, like, lighting discussion. So, um, yeah, lighting is, like, obviously a really massive part of, like, theatrical design. And I suppose I'm really curious to hear more about how you sort of take lighting and then how you're able to sort of take more control over lighting as well, especially from, like, a costume perspective because it's not really something that I suppose costume designers are like, used to necessarily like integrating and then being able to like control that properly because obviously we're not lighting designers, but um, yeah, I suppose what the um, connection is there. Um, sure, so 
uh, on the first part of it, um, part of this when Courtney and I got inspired on it was that we wanted to democratize how the creative process worked. Um, and we felt that the light being into the costume was not either or, that it had to happen together. Um, and very much so, like I had to pay a lot of attention to temperature and protecting Courtney's electronics to make sure things, wires were supported correctly that we wouldn't break soldering points. Um, so I had to do a lot of thinking and studying of how the person was moving in the costume. Um, and Courtney was incredibly helpful with looking into different technologies. Um, if you want to talk about waterproofing. Yeah, so when talking about building the costumes, it, it really was, the structure was really important because the more flex that you have, obviously on copper, the, the more strained it gets and it doesn't work anymore. Again, repeatable and reliable results. So having that, those conversations really early was, was really what the most important part was. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, Rachel. Uh, hello, I'm Rachel Han. Um, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a cultural stenographer and I do a bit of cosplay, so I'm up for that. <laughs> I've got a question for Charlotta and Lydia um, about uh, <laughs> uh, Sally's work. So I've also done the uh, somatic costume dressing room. If you've done it yourselves, I wonder if you could just reflect on uh, how that might inform your work as costume designers. So I think the movement side of it and discovering the material processes, possibly from a performer slash everyday life point of view, I think was quite clear. But I, if it would be just useful to hear a bit more about uh, a somatic approach to costume design um, and what your experiences as costume designers doing it was. Um, yeah, okay, so I wasn't one of the people that she specifically did the costume dressing room to, but I've been working with Sally as the costume design, as the costume maker and sort of collaborative design process um, at Kiel at uh, Kunsthochschule in Oslo. Um, so I was, so I've, I've, we had a lot of very long discussions of kind of what things feel like, a lot of the weight, a lot of just being in the room together, kind of moving around, and then you, you're very surprised by what does bother you by what, uh, and then by what bothers other people. So it's a lot of, for my body, this feels right. In this moment, this feels wrong. And then suddenly, a little way down the line, we start thinking about colors and textures, and then go, oh, no, no, we don't want to think about colors anymore, and then we go back. So it's a lot of finding little spontaneous accidents. And as a costume designer, I've really been able to take that into sort of my wider, wider practice. I've just finished my master's. Um, so really being engaged in just the way things feel and where my feelings come out and then how other people respond to that back again. Um, and a really nice sort of mirror process. Make it, maybe I can just add, I've been working with Sally for many years and, and I'm a costume designer myself. And for me, that approach from the somatic practice and that doesn't necessarily focus on the visuality, is actually really informative for a costume designer in the, the practice because we often speak about how it looks, we don't speak so much about how it feels. And I think as, as actually the former panel were talking about uh, kind of these pedagogical approaches, thinking about that it also offers a voice, I think Sally's really good at articulating something that uh, makes me very aware as a costume designer of how does my costume feel for the person that wears it, how much I actually in my design process need to be aware of that. And Sally talks a lot about aware, awareness and that is just really a really big uh, contribution, I would say. So thank you for the question. <laughs> thank you very much, Charlotte. Do we have any more questions? Yes, there is a, there is a hand. Yeah, up there is he, up there is he, and afterwards you. And if you could introduce yourself, please. Hi, my name is Parker. I'm a costume designer from Vancouver, BC. And I had a question for Zuzu. I was just curious how the relation between the parameters of dance costuming and how you need to allow a performer to move um, limits or inspires how to use it as a main character. If there's a way that it almost inhibits some aspects that you wish you could explore, or if it enhances others. 
Okay, so are you interested how the performers are reacting on the costumes? How do they feel, right? <laughs> yeah, it's basically if you start with the costume and then go to the movement, how does the movement within the dance affect yes. how you design? It was very interesting because uh, actually that was the first time when I started to, this my, uh, to do this my project. Uh, it starts from the costumes, because before, when I was designing the costumes for different dance performance, uh, there was always some kind of choreography already or story, and then I was designing the costumes for them. But now, I brought the costumes for the performers, and they were trying how they can do the choreography and they, the movements in the costume. So actually, they, they somehow, they were like, long hand uh, to the to the to the costume so they got like some steady object and they they start to move it and they start to do the choreography and what was very I interesting because when I designed the costumes of course sometimes I tried also on myself but I didn't have this feeling that actually how it is to dance when you don't see anything because also in these uh, inflatable costumes, they didn't see anything, just some kind of source of light. So they really, they were completely lost on the stage and they really <laughs> just feeling the, 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 the sound, uh, the music, and uh, we find out that uh, the source of the light is helping to orientate in the space. So they always had to have like just one light somewhere so they know that what is in the front and what is in the back. But uh, yes, it was very inspirative for them to have all these limitations and to dance and to create movements and choreographies with these limitations. Thank you very much for the question, Zuzu. Thank you very much for the answer. Yes, we have a, a question here. Hello, my name is Julie Scharf. I'm a recent costume design graduate from Carnegie Mellon University. And I have a question for Charlotte and Lydia. Um, for the somatic dressing room, how did you and Sally establish boundaries and comfort with touch and intimacy between Sally and the wearer? You want <laughs> you can, you can, you can Sally's presence, just to begin with, is a very comforting. She has, she has, she has, a, she has a very comforting aura just to sort of start off going into the room with her. Um, but yeah, she works very hard. To, there's a lot of asking, asking permission. Is this okay? I'm going to do this now. This will happen next, and sort of making people, and also always making sure people know how to get out, how to say, right, this is enough. Take it all off. Whether it's sort of agreed upon hand signals or the performance I was working on her with. Um, our victims, our, um, <laughs> our people had um, masks over their faces, so it was take it off if you, at any point you need a breather, stand still, stop moving, and a lot of kind of intuitive body language things, but then a lot of verbal cues and pre-establishing that going into the room that at any point you can say no, and at any point really encouraging people to say they don't like something and offering alternatives and but yeah sally just has it comes very naturally to her but she also works on it that you feel safe and and just to say also it, it I, I really believe it is a really big part of her somatic practice that awareness of the body the awareness of her own body but also other people's bodies and that gives a really big yeah the, the comfort of others, uh, as I think that Lydia says very fine, that she's, she's really tuned in, but I think it is a really, really long practice of this somatic, somatic approach uh, that doesn't just, uh, is something that you do overnight, uh, it is actually a lot of work, so I think, I think there is, is a lot of um, the information in her work in, in that really strong based practice. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, do we have any more questions? Oh yes, there is a question over here. Is he the, the, the lady in the green garment? Hi, I made it. <laughs> uh, my name is May. I'm a former student and employee of Robin and Courtney's. Um, but this is an open question for anyone who has ideas. How you compromise between your ideal and the reality. Obviously, you want a beautiful, fully realized and sustainably built piece, but you might have budget restrictions, uh, the wearability question, and your director might not agree with your ideas. <laughs> you, you don't have a director? 
<laughs> no, that one of the reasons that we chose to work on a script between the two of us was we wanted the time and the freedom to explore this process without having input and restrictions put on us from an ex exterior source. So that really did help in the exploration process. Obviously, when this would be implemented in a stage design, there would be much more input from the director, the other designers, the performers. So it, it, it becomes just a constant conversation. Thank you very much. Any more panelists? Would you like? Yes. I could actually, by being responsive to the situation, instead of seeing it as a struggle, adapting, going, working together with everything that is there at that moment, sort of not seeing them as limitations, but more as, as what is available and then sort of making the best of that through sort of finding the collaborative ground also with, with the people who are directing or, or choreographing or what is the sort of funding available or, or the space, if the space explodes underneath you or whatever circumstances there are. It's sort of at least for me, it has been a lot much less stressful since then. I don't know if Ingrid, you agree. Yes, and, and I um, just want to add also to what Suski is saying, like yeah, balancing this ideal and real, like ideality and reality, you know, is it one sort of strategy also as a designer to get involved at the product, you know, with a producer hat a bit, and you know, you make your premises. What premises do you need to create the work that you're interested in? Do you, do, does that mean you need, uh, you know, a different kind of budget or a different kind of production period where actually you embed blocks of work that you can kind of congregate and test things and try things and, you know, have, have some time and then you do more and, and somehow, you know, think, you know, how can we structure our collaborative processes also by coming together and then, you know, moving apart and coming together without this pressure, okay, like in five weeks I have a premiere, shit, I need to get it to work because perhaps I can create a little bit of more space uh, to, to try and uh, to try things out and see where it, where it goes also. Does that answer your question somehow? Yeah. Maybe I'd just like to give a go from, from my, myself, not for Sally, but I think actually there's something in the reality also saying, well, this is the budget. So also being truthful, saying, well, maybe I dreamt of doing this, or maybe you are expecting this, but if this is the reality, this is what we have to work with. So I cannot do, I cannot do anything for a really small budget. And for m myself, I've always tried to kind of find that path and finding my little hook. It might not been the great grand costumes that I could make, but I could find always find a hook on looking into color, looking into a specific shape, something that would make me engaged. But maybe, yeah, maybe it wasn't the dream, but I think reality is really important and this that also saying, well, this is what I need. And also saying, this is what is, you can expect within this reality. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah, Ingvill. Yeah, just adding again to, <laughs> to Charlotte there. It's like, yeah, say what you need and saying no. And, and also, you know, during the process somehow say like, okay, well, it's not actually working out how I thought. Now I need something else. Or we actually cannot do this that we thought we would be able to do without this fear of, uh, of um, you know, it's the end of the production. In case, you know, again, reality, uh, communicating within the working group also where we're at, keeping that open uh, throughout the process. I find there's also this kind of catharsis in release of you have this idea and this design and when you let go of what you know it has to be, you can find something really interesting as you explore with other people. I don't know, yeah, probably. I was gonna say that um, when when you let go of that piece or you know the piece that you truly don't want to let go of. So know which parts you're willing to compromise on, know which parts can go away and that, that core of what makes it special will still be there and you can still bring that to life um, and then you can scale it. So then you can find the scale and still find that joy in it. Yeah. I don't know, Zuzu? 
I agree with everything what everybody said because it's really true. I also did this my, my own project because there was never time when I was designing for somebody else. I, I brought something and they were like, no, 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 but we have to be busy with the choreography and dance and we don't have time to try the things out. And I was like, okay, so again, we get these trousers and t-shirts and you will be happy. <laughs> so uh, that's why I made my own, uh, own project that finally I could uh, try my experiments and and we have we had time for it and yes because this uh, pressure of the time and pressure of the budget is 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 really limiting because everybody expect that you know from the beginning that it will work when you design it on the paper but it's not true because i mean you have the, some vision you have some design but it doesn't mean that you are also trying some things in the fir first time in the life you you don't know everything immediately so and then they are look, staring at you like what a professional you are, that it doesn't work and so on. So you are also not, yeah, many, many costume designers are not even brave to try the things because, uh, yeah, they are scared about their reputation as well because uh, if you fail, nobody will call you anymore maybe. So that's, uh, yeah, that's difficult. So that's why it's great to make uh, time to time your own uh, your own project when you can fulfill your dreams. Wonderful, thank you. Heli, would you like to add anything for, on the relation between the ideal and reality, the concept and the realization? I don't know. Um, I'm not entirely sure if this applies to my work. Um, with Shadow Work, um, we have such a small team and we're basically working on it um, during the work time. Uh, so basically no budget and we can do whatever we want within the technical restrictions. That's the only limitation we have, what we can do with the techni technology we have access to. Okay, wonderful. We have one last minute, which I would like to uh, spend thanking our panelists today on Flash Talk. <laughs> so it's Ingvil, Susanna, Robin, Courtney, Zuzu, Heli, Lydia, and Charlotte. <laughs>